Okay, so welcome to this next video in the playlist on group theory. In this video, what we're going to do is study a theorem that, in my opinion, is extremely important for having a good conceptual understanding of group theory, and this is KV's theorem. Okay, so let me just outline then for you the structure of this video. So what I'm going to start off with is uh, a bit of the motivation for Cayley's theorem, what we're actually trying to do with Cayley's theorem, okay, what we're trying to achieve. Uh, then what I'll do is I'll go over a little bit of prerequisite knowledge, okay? Uh, so I want to explain something about the composition tables of groups to you before we actually go on uh, to look at Cayley's theorem, okay? And then finally what I'll do is actually show you Cayley's theorem and how it works and how it achieves what we set out to achieve. Okay, right. Uh, so firstly then, the motivation for Cayley's theorem. So firstly, let me just go over something that hopefully you're getting the hang of now, which is the definition of a group. So remember what the definition of a group is. So if we call our group capital G here, the definition of a group is that it fundamentally is a set of symbols. Okay, so here is our set of symbols like so. Okay, and this set of symbols could be a finite set of symbols, or it could be an infinite set of symbols. Okay, and to turn this set into a group, what you need to have defined on this set of symbols is a composition law. Okay, uh, so this involves creating a composition table, which I'll show here. Okay, so we'll call our composition abstract composition, like so. And basically, what you need to do is you need to put all of your symbols in the group down here. So you need to give every symbol of the group a row, basically, in this composition table. And you need to put all of the symbols of the group up here, giving every symbol a column. And then you need to go through and define all of the answers here. So what any element composed with any other element, what any little x composed with little y is equal to. Okay, and I'll just put these in. So little x composed with little y, little x and little y are just representing arbitrary symbols from this group um, here. Okay, and here is the row uh, dedicated to little x, and here is the column dedicated to little y, and then basically you need the answer of what little x composed with little y is in that composition table. And you need that for every possible one of those pairs, basically. So you need to define this entire composition table. Okay, right. Uh, so, a group then is a set with a composition law defined on it. Okay, and this composition law needs to obey certain axioms that we've now studied in depth. So, firstly, it needs to be closed. And that means that all of the entries in the composition table need to be from the set here. So you can't compose two elements of the set together and get a symbol that's outside of the set. Okay, that should hopefully be pretty common sense. Uh, the second is really, really complicated. That's associativity, and that basically says that when you compose three things together, it doesn't matter where you put the brackets uh, for that composition. Okay, so this composition law doesn't tell us how to define how to um, compose three things together. So if, for instance, we want to take x composed with y composed with z, what we have to do is turn that into composing two things together at a time. Okay, and there are two ways of doing that. Either you can put the brackets around x composed with y, and this now means firstly compose x and y together, which you can do using our composition law, and then take the answer, whatever that is, which is an element of the uh, set here, and compose that with z. So that reduces this question of composing three things together down to a question of composing two things together at a time, basically, okay, and therefore it can be done from this composition law. But there is another way of doing this as well. You could also have put the brackets around y composed with z, and this now means compose y and z together first, get an answer, and then take x and compose it with that answer. And basically, if the composition law obeys associativity, it means that these two ways of doing things give exactly the same answer for all little x, little y, and little z in the group, basically. Okay, so that's axiom number two that the composition law needs to obey. Okay, axiom number three is that there needs to be an identity element. Okay, there needs to be an element within the group, okay, which we often call 
uh, middle E, okay, uh, which composes with any other arbitrary element within the group to give that arbitrary element back again, and that's true whichever way round you compose them. So if you take E composed with little g, that needs to give you back little g. Okay, and that's for all little g is an element of capital G. Okay, so what that basically means is that if we give little e a row here, which of course it will have a row because it is an element of the group, then basically all of the answers in this row are just uh, the elements of the group translated down basically. So obviously up here in this title portion, we will put every single element of the group and now you'll just uh, be translating them down into their equivalent positions down here to get the answers to all of this row, okay, because E will compose with little g to give little g back again. So basically, for little y here, you'll have little y just below it in this row, okay? Also, the other way around, it has to be the case that g composed with E has to give g again for all little g as an element of big G. And what that means is if we give E now a column here, then all of the entries in this column here, again, are just the entries here translated along, basically. So the answer here will be E, the answer here will be X, basically, like so. Okay, uh, so that's what it means to have an identity element. There is an element which composes with all elements of the group just to give the, the other element of the group back again, and that works either way round. Okay, so that's axiom number three, and I'll just label this up as axiom number two, and we'll put axiom number one over here, which was closure, remember. Okay, so I'll colour in axiom number three in blue. Right, the final axiom of group theory, then, that this composition law needs to obey is uh, axiom number four, and that's the criterion that there needs to be inverse elements. Okay, so basically, for all little g is an element of capital G. So you take any symbol in this group, basically, okay? Um, there has to be another symbol in the group, which we'll call g inverse, g to the power of negative one, like so. There must exist g inverse, which is an element of the group, so there must be another symbol within the group. And note, it's not necessarily the case that this symbol is different from the original symbol. Sometimes an element will be its own inverse, so it might be the case that you're looking at the exact same symbol, okay? But the property that it has to obey is that, um, oh, and I shouldn't put that, such that, okay, st, uh, g composed with g inverse is equal to the identity, and also the other way around, so g inverse composed with g, and I've forgotten the composition symbol, I'll just squeeze it in there, is equal to the identity. Okay, and that has to be true for all little g is an element of big G. Okay, so what this means in terms of the composition table is that you take any symbol in the group, and we'll call, we might as well take little x here, okay, there has to exist another symbol in the group, which we might call x inverse here, such that those two composed together gives back the identity, okay, and it also works the other way around, so if we have, uh, how should I do this, I'll squeeze x inverse in there, and I'll put x up there. If we compose them the other way around, we do x inverse composed with x, that will also give the identity, basically. Okay? Uh, and that has to be true for whatever element of the group you pick. So, for all elements of the group, you can find another element of the group such that when you compose the two together, either way around, it gives you the identity element. Okay, right. Uh, so, that's the abstract definition of a group, okay? However, what I have dwelled upon a lot in previous videos is the fact that the way you can actually create these things is by thinking in terms of set permutations of some set, okay? So what you can do is take a sum set and think of set permutations which are bijective maps of the set onto itself, okay? And what you can do is give those set permutations symbols, okay, and then those symbols you can put into a set, and that set containing these symbols representing set permutations is what you can then uh, call your group. And then the way you can define the group composition law is just, 
If you want to know what two symbols composed together is equal to, all you can do is compose together the set permutations of this set, and I'll call this set S. Okay, so what you can do is, if you want to compose any two symbols together in the group, then you can think about what set permutations of this set S do they represent, and if I compose those set permutations together, what new set permutation do I get? Then think about what symbol is represented by that new set permutation, and put that symbol as your answer in the composition law. Okay, now we've talked about how that means that you will automatically get associativity to work, basically. Okay, if you think about creating groups in this way by defining the composition law through the composition of the set permutations, it instantly uh, obeys this associative property because it really uh, does not matter where you put the brackets because there is an answer to what the composition of three set permutations actually is. So it really does not matter where you put the brackets. Okay, right. Uh, then what you need to do to get the identity property is have a symbol representing the identity map, which will compose with any other set permutation to give that other set permutation back again. Okay, so that's how you get this property to work. And the final property is equivalent then to saying that for any set permutation that you have represented by a symbol in your group, you need to have another symbol representing the inverse set permutation. Okay, right. Uh, so, that's a very nice way to build groups. But, remember, the definition of a group doesn't involve that. That's a nice way to build a group. But, fundamentally, this is what a group is. It's just a set of symbols with the composition law defined on it. So, that raises an interesting question. Okay, we know that we can use this concept of set permutations of some set to be able to build a group. But, is it the case that if you have a group, okay, a set of symbols with a composition law defined on it, is it the case that there is always some set for which you can view the elements of the group here as representing set permutations of that set? So basically, this is the great motivating question for Cayley's theorem. We have seen in previous videos about how we can build groups by thinking in terms of set permutations of some set. Okay, however, that's not part of the definition of a group. This is the definition of a group. Okay, so the question now becomes, is it the case that we can always think of a group as being a set of symbols where these symbols are representing set permutations of some set? Okay, so that's the big question that we are going to ask. And basically, Cayley's theorem is going to give us the answer to that, and the answer is yes. Okay, so that's the motivation finished now. In the next video, I will go on to this little bit of background understanding about the composition law on a group that I want you to understand before we then discuss how Cayley's theorem can find you a set for which you can think of the symbols of the group as representing set permutations of that set.